want to talk about four trends in the next 25 years. These four trends are things that are inevitable. The particular products or company are not inevitable. But the trends are going to happen no matter what we do. So we should be ready to embrace them. The first trend I think that is the most important one is the idea that we're going to make everything a little bit smarter. I use a fancy word in English called cognify, to make smarter. Cognifying is something we also know as artificial intelligence. But I hope to take this word that you've heard before and give you a little bit of an idea of why I think it's so important. First of all, we start with this idea that maybe we should be using artificial smartness rather than intelligence because it kind of gives a better idea of what we're going to see. Your calculator is already smarter than you are in arithmetic. Your GPS unit is smarter than you are in spatial navigation. A search engine like Google is smarter than you are in long-term memory. So already the machines have some kind of intelligence. We have a, an idea about our own intelligence, we call it IQ. And the idea is that it's a single dimension, like loudness, that is getting, improving from maybe a mouse, and then a rat, and then a monkey, and then an idiot, and then an average person like you and me, and then a genius. And AI. And this idea is totally wrong. That's not what intelligence is. It's not a single dimension. It is a suite of a dozen different types of cognition. Your brain, your mind has perception, has spatial awareness, symbolic reasoning, deductive reasoning, logic inference. It has many, many types of intelligences, plural, embedded into it. It's a complex. It's a symphony of different types of thinking and it will, of course, vary from person to person. And so what I want to give you is a, is a picture that will make hundreds of different types of AI. It's plural, they're not just one type. There are many types and none of them are like humans. The kinds of artificial minds that we will make will not think like humans. That's their benefit. That's their attraction. So we'll make this zoo of different types of artificial thinking. And the reason why we don't like them to be humans is because we can do humans. We don't want a human to drive a car. We want an AI to drive a car because it's not thinking like a human. As we connect ourselves together, as we have seven billion people connected together all the time, that makes it really hard to think differently. If you're connected to all humans all the time, it becomes difficult to think differently. And that's actually one of the advantages of AI is that it's helping us to think differently because it thinks differently. So thinking different is one aspect of AI. The second one that I want to emphasize is that it's an artificial, it's a new artificial power. And we had an industrial revolution that created the city that you're in. That, and that was all because we had invented artificial power. Before that time, during the agricultural age, the only way to get anything done was to use natural muscle power of a human or an animal. If you wanted to build a house, you had to use muscle power natural power, if you wanted to build a road, natural power, if you wanted to make clothes, natural power. And we invented artificial power, steam locomotives, engines, oil power, nuclear power, electrical power. And that liberated us to make at a scale we could never do before. So we could actually make this building, make this city, make your clothes, make all the chairs in this room through artificial power. And we distributed that artificial power on a grid called the electrical grid, to all homes, all factories, all companies. And that grid made electricity into a commodity, a utility that anybody could purchase. If you wanted some artificial power, you just bought 
as much power as you wanted or needed. And that access enabled like a farmer somewhere to have an idea. The farmer had a manual, naturally powered pump. You had to use muscle power to make the water pump work. And he had an idea. Hmm, I'm going to buy some artificial power, some electricity, and I'm going to invent an electric pump that would work day and night. That electric pump was the Industrial Revolution. You multiply that by a million examples and you have the Industrial Revolution that made, again, the environment that we have built. Now we're going to do the same thing again, but with artificial intelligence. We're going to take the electric pump and we're going to add some artificial intelligence to it and we're going to make a smart pump. And we're going to multiply that by a million times. And that's the second industrial revolution that this AI is all about. Okay? So when you drive a car down the highway, you push a button or turn a switch, and you summon the power of equivalent of 250 horses, of natural power. 250 natural power horses are, are, you, are for you to drive down the road, but you could also use it to throw up a skyscraper. You could also use it to manufacture clothes, cloth at miles per hour. You could use it to manufacture all the chairs and all the shoes in this room. That's the power that we have with artificial power. And now we're going to add 250 minds to it. They're not human minds. It's a kind of thinking, but it's not human thinking. And that combination of the artificial power and the artificial intelligence is a self-driving car. And so I suggest that the formula for the next 10,000 startups is very, very simple, which is take, X, take something and add AI to it. So if you took cars and added, or if you took taxi cabs and added AI, you have Uber. You could take Shoes, add AI. What do you have? Take food and add AI. What robots and AI are doing is they're, they're, they're taking the tasks where productivity and efficiency are critical and matter. And so those are the kinds of tasks that go to AIs and robots are things where efficiency count. But there's a whole bunch of things that we want done where efficiency doesn't count. And that's what humans are good for. So what doesn't count with efficiency? Well, like science is inherently inefficient. The only way you can discover something new is by doing an experiment that fails. Failure is inefficient. The only way you can discover something new is trying to go somewhere where you have a dead end. A dead end is inefficient. The only way you can do innovation in a startup is to try things that don't work. That's inefficient. If you were 100% efficient as a scientist or innovator, you would learn nothing. When Garry Kasparov, the world's best chess player, lost to Deep Blue, the biggest AI at that time, he was very upset. And he said, you know, I'd lost, but if I, Garry Kasparov, had had access to the database of all the moves that Deep Blue had, Deep Blue won because it knew and had a record in his brain of every single chess move ever played. Kasparov says, if I had access to that, I would have won. So he said, it's really not fair. I want to start a new chess league where humans can play alongside of the AIs together. And he called that a centaur, that team of a human plus an AI, like the Greek mythological creature of half man, half horse. A centaur was half AI, half human. And it turns out that that's a very, very powerful combination. And today on the planet, the best chess player on this world is not an AI. The best chess player on this planet is not a human. The best chess player on this planet is a centaur. It's a human plus AIs. It's actually 
multiple humans and multiple AIs. So the second trend I want to talk about is interacting. Interacting, every time we make a machine, a new invention, a new device, we want to interact with it more and more and more. That's what's increasing over time. And um, we're no longer people of the book. We're now people of the screen. Screens are how we interact with our machines. Um, I was involved with Steven Spielberg in inventing uh, the technology for the movie The Minority Report, where we kind of imagined that the future of interfaces for computers was using your hands, and the Tom Cruise character would conduct the data. And um, it's not just the big gestures, but even little gestures, the micro gestures in your fingers can also be recognized, and that's another way to interact with our technology. And we have conversation voice now with the Amazon Alexa and Google Home where you actually talk to them back and forth and that's becoming really, very, really, very, very exact. But the ultimate way that we interact is by going into the computer, going right into it. And we call that virtual reality and that's where you put on a pair of goggles. And there's two kinds of VR. There's the immersive kind where you put the <laughs> headset on and you're in a different place called it VR. Then there's another kind called MR or AR, where you take something like a piece of uh, clear glass goggles and you put them on and you see the room, but there's virtual things in the room. There's a virtual chair that you can walk around and you can see it and inspect it and maybe even move it with your hand. Um, and that is actually very, very useful for doing design, industrial design. The third trend I want to talk about is accessing. You know, Uber is the largest taxi cab company in the world and it owns no cars. And Facebook is the world's largest media company and it owns no content. Alibaba is the largest retailer in the world and it owns no inventory. Airbnb is the largest real uh, lodging company in the world and it owns no real estate. So owning things is not as important as it used to be. And that's... True, we're seeing a shift from being having access to these things versus owning them. So there's a consumer shift from having access, instant access to what we need rather than owning it. Because owning can be a liability. It requires backing up, securing, storing, filing, cataloging, cleaning, so many things. If you access them, it's much easier as a consumer. If you can have rapid delivery, if you can have immediate manufacturing with 3D printing at a neighborhood corner store that would print out what you needed within 15 minutes, or the dematerialization of things where things become lighter and lighter, all these things suggest that even in the physical world, owning things is not as important as it used to be. It's not going to go away. Somebody has to own things. But it won't become the default. The default will be accessing things rather than owning them. And that is this on-demand economy that we often talk about, which is, again, if you can have things on demand when you want them, you don't have to buy them. But that means a huge opportunity for figuring out how you can deliver things instantly on demand, called the Uber effects. The last thing I want to talk about is sharing. Again, we, you know, the Ubers is kind of a sharing economy. We share the same car. We don't own it. But I want to expand this a little bit. And that is, it doesn't matter what business you're in today, you are now in a data business. Agriculture, it's a data business. Chemicals, it's a data business. Mining, it's a data business. Hoteling, it's a data business. Banks, of course, it's a data business. It doesn't matter. You're now in a data business. And, it, and data is sort of the new oil. It's, it's the new wealth. It's, it's, it's how you get the power. The biggest companies in the world today are all data companies. Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're all, they're all data companies. And data about your customers is almost as valuable as your customers. I think we're just at the very, very beginning, the first hour of the first day, really. And if we took a time machine to the year 2052, which is 25 years from now, 
We're in 2052, and we're going to look back at this year here. One of the things we'd realize is that there are no experts. A lot of people working on AI, they're highly paid, but they don't know anything really compared to what we'll know in 25 years. You'll realize that today there's no experts. There's no experts in VR. We don't even know how VR works. There's no experts in sharing and data. Everything started this year. We would realize if we look back that, oh, it, nothing, ha nothing that happened before 2017 really counted. It all started around about now when we first started figuring out how to do VR and AI to, to manage data. So compared to the past, there's never been better tools for making things. There's never been larger markets. There's never been cheaper money to borrow. There's never been lower barriers to entry than right now today, this year. But also, compared to the future, this is the best time because there's no experts and it's, there's low-hanging fruit to be picked. There's no competition comparatively because it's just started. It's cheap to enter. So compared to where we're going in 25 years, this is absolutely the best time to start. Of all the things I told you, I forgot to tell you the most important one. And that's because I don't know what it is. That's because the, the most important thing in 25 years from I have not yet been invented today. If I was giving this talk 25 years ago, I would not have mentioned the web or smartphones. So I'm pretty sure that of all the things I've told you, I didn't tell you the most important one, which has not been invented yet. So this is still the best time because the best inventions are before us. We haven't invented. We have the best tools ever in the history of humanity. We have no experts. It means that you're not late. You're not late. This is the beginning. Go and make something happen. This is the best time ever. Thank you for your attention.